Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. When we think of the Latin American literary avant-garde, the first names that come to mind are usually the names of poets. Cesar Vallejo in Peru, Vicente Huidobro in Chile, Oliverio Girondo in Argentina, etc. And all of these are great names, but what many people forget to say is that narrative was also a very important aspect of this movement. What I want to focus on today are four little gems of the Latin American literary avant-garde, four novellas, okay, published in four different countries in the 1920s and 30s. Our first stop is going to be Mexico, because we're going to look at La Señorita Etc., Miss Etc., from 1922 by Arqueles Vela. Arqueles Vela was a Mexican author who may have been born in Guatemala. We are not really sure about that. And he was primarily associated with a poetic avant-garde movement called Estridentismo. Now, La Señorita Etc. is basically the account of a love affair and its disintegration. And it's a very elliptic account. Much of the story takes place on a train. And this is very appropriate, right? Because as you know, the train is generally used as a symbol of modernity. So the anxiety that the narrator has for modernity is really clear because of that setting. The characters even become mechanized at one point in the story and when they are described by using metaphors, the metaphors link them to technology. So you can see how appropriate the whole text is when it comes to its attitude towards the modernization process that was going on at the time. The lady of the title, Miss Etc., is at one point also described as a feminist and a syndicalist. So you can see that, as Bob Dylan put it, the times they are a-changing, right? And the narrator is really anxious about all that. This is, as I said, a, an elliptic text, and it's, a, it's very disjointed and also very poetic. So you're going to see that many of the novellas that I'm sharing with you, even though they were written in a narrative mode, were written by poets, and you can really tell. Next, uh, let's go to Ecuador, okay? a country that you don't hear a whole lot about when it comes to literature, and I feel that that is really unfair. I have for you Débora, okay? from 1927, by Pablo Palacio. This is the most experimental of the four novellas that I am sharing with you, and it follows the quote-unquote adventures or misadventures of a character that we know as lieutenant. So at the center of the text, we have a figure of authority, even a figure of power, uh, if you will, and he really is a pathetic figure. In a way, Devora is functioning in the mode of the dictator novel, okay, because of this character that we have at the center of the story. So this guy is just walking around, right, he meets a friend, he tries to seduce a girl, we hear about all of the things that happen to him throughout the, this time that he is just walking. The narrative really is uh, completely adrift, you know, there is no plot here. The narrative is kind of random at times, and, and that frustrates all our expectations as readers, which is something that I absolutely love. As a reader, not, not as a human being, but as a reader, I really love to be frustrated. Because if I am not frustrated, it means that they're just giving me the same old formulas, as always. You know, so that is a really good thing in this case. Now, the title, Débora, right? The title is really misleading, okay? Uh, at one point, I was like, you know, getting towards the end of the novella, and I was like, why is this called Débora, right? So it is misleading, but I would say it's also quite relevant and it's suggestive. You know, it's not obvious. It doesn't have the obvious title, right? L the lieutenant walks around or something like that. That would be ridiculous. So I really like the, the choice of title too, because you keep reading in order to find out why is this title Devora. And um, eventually, you know, you, you find out. There's also a touch of metafiction there, just so you know. So I immediately thought of The Hour of the Star by Clarice Lispector. In the late 30s, this is something about the author, right? The uh, Pablo Palacio developed mental health issues and he spent quite a bit of time in a psychiatric hospital. If you want to know the, that thing about Débora, okay? This is how César Aira, the great Argentine author, described it. He said, Débora is nausea, you know, Sartre's nausea, written by Macedonio Fernández. That is the perfect description and I thought that was really hilarious too. So, uh, let's travel to Peru now, okay? Uh, the next one is La Casa de Cartón, The Cardboard House, 1928, by Martín Adán, 
Okay, Martín Adán is a pseudonym. I do have the copy for this one, so let me show you that. Martín Adán is a pseudonym, right? His real name was Rafael de la Fuente Benavides. What is La Casa de Cartón? La Casa de Cartón is basically a series of vignettes about life in the coastal city of Barranco in Peru. So at first it's going to seem to you as you read it that there's really no protagonist other than Barranco itself. You know what I mean? It's about the setting primarily. But little by little you realize that this is actually the story of a young man, a teenager, really. He is unnamed, remains unnamed throughout the story and also about his friendship with a guy named Ramon and his romance with a girl named Catita. That is basically the, the topic of the cardboard house. The descriptions are really beautiful because they have a dreamlike quality to them. It's like something that you see through a haze or something like that. It is also a very literary text because there are constant references to other authors, you know, Proust, Joyce, Pirandello, those kind of authors that were um, on vogue at that time. So you, you see a very, you know, very clear consciousness of literature in the text too. The vignettes themselves, as you can imagine, constitute a mosaic. Okay, so at the end of the reading, you're like, okay, I have all these little pieces and you put them together and you have an idea of what this place is like and what the characters are like too. Uh, Adán did not really consider this to be a novel. And just so you know, Martín Adán was primarily a poet. He actually won the national prize uh, for poetry in Peru. So, you know, once again, as was the case with La Señorita, etc., we really have a text that you can tell was written by a poet. Now, the narrator's voice, even though Adán was a poet, is really spellbinding. You know, it's, I, I mean, it just draws you in. You feel as if you had actually visited this place of Barranco. So it's really, really nice and a really, really engaging text. And our last stop is going to be Chile, because I have for you Asher or Yesterday by Juan Emar. This is a later text, okay? It's from 1935. And Juan Emar is also a pseudonym. His real name was Álvaro Yáñez Bianchi. And some people say that Juan Emar in the French form, Jean Emar, is a play of words, you know? Jean Emar. I'm fed up, right? So that is the play of words right there that uh, he decided to use when he chose his pseudonym. Asher, or yesterday, is basically the story of a day, as the title suggests. A day in which the narrator, uh, in the company of his wife, saw a man being guillotined, went to the zoo, visited a painter's studio, visited the family, meditated on a very fat man, urinated and finally tried to find meaning in all of these things that he did during that day. So I would say the account of the day, you know, one 24-hour day is like the perfect, um, you know, topic or, or the perfect structure for, for the novella. Because the novella, as you know, and as I've said like a million times before, doesn't really focus on plot. It's really, you know, quite free when it comes to the structure. So if you do have a time span, specific time span, then you can say, okay, uh, I can give some structure to this without having, you know, the constraints of plot, for instance. So Asher is really a re-examination, which is what the novella does as a genre. It's an attempt to assess, okay, this is what happened to me during the day of yesterday. Let's try to find meaning in that. It's a chronological narrative in this case, so, you know, not, not very experimental, not, not as disjointed as some of the other novellas that I just told you about. But um, in terms of the topic and, and the approach, right, the approach of the narrator, the tone, basically, it reminded me of the early novels of Samuel Beckett. For instance, I'm thinking of Mercier and Camille, which is like a really, really funny book if you want to experience that. Not many people mention it because it doesn't really have the typical style of the Beckett of the trilogy, for instance, but that is a really funny uh, little novel. And then I was also reminded of the films of Luis Buñuel because of the surrealist humor, you know, and also because of the violence that is like underlying the, the story, you know, below the surface there's this terrible violence. It begins with a guy being guillotined, you know what I mean? So it's like, um, I, I really enjoyed that part of, of the text. Uh, Juan Emar is like a fascinating figure. He wrote three novellas, this uh, wonderful collection of stories, short stories titled Diez or Ten. It's one of the best short story collections that I have ever read. And then after that, he dedicated the rest of his life to writing this monster titled 
umbral. Okay, it's like a multi-volume work. I saw it like once in my life at, uh, at this huge library. They had a copy of it. I think it amounts to like 5,000 pages or something like that. So it was published posthumously. But that's, that's how he spent the last years of his life, writing this huge, you know, body of work. So a very, very interesting author. So I hope you enjoyed this journey through the Latin American literary avant-garde through four paradigmatic texts of the movement. Now one question that you may have, and it is a very valid question, is how available are these texts, right? So two of them have been translated into English. There's a translation of The Cardboard House by Martina Dan by Catherine Silver, okay, who also translated Julio Ramon Ribeiro. More to come about that. Uh, that came out a few years ago. And then we have also a translation of Asher or Yesterday by Megan McDowell that was published like literally this year. Both of them are in new directions. So, you know, you can find those very, very easily. And by the way, The Cardboard House is a book that really needs more attention. You know, not many people talked about it, even when it was translated into English. And it's still too early to, to know anything about yesterday, right? Because it, it was literally just published. Now, the original texts of these novellas are very, very easy to find. Like, three of them are available to read online for free. So please look at the description for this video so that, you know, I, I'm going to share the links to these texts there. The only one that I could not find online that I had actually to buy was Martina Dan's La Casa de Carton. So really they are quite easy to find. I hope you get the chance to experience at least the ones that have been published in English and maybe in other languages too. But if you do read Spanish, you know, uh, these are really, really good texts to experience. Do you have any questions, recommendations, comments? Have you read any of these? Are there other, you know, avant-garde texts that you enjoyed? Please let me know. I always enjoy hearing your comments and your experiences with these books. So those are my thoughts on the Latin American literary avant-garde, four novellas from four different countries that sort of represent the movement. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.